Um, welcome to uh, this, uh, this evening's Institute lecture. Um, I'm delighted to see the room almost full uh, for a lecture on uh, the art of diplomacy in the 21st century, um, which uh, we're very happy. Uh, ambassador, uh, ambassador, ambassador François Barrard, uh, of, uh, currently of, of, uh, he's based in uh, the Consul General uh, of Switzerland in New York, but we're very pleased that he agreed to give this talk. He's actually in town for uh, a rather busy event, part, uh, a special guest of the president of NYU who was invited to, to take part in the admissions process for our uh, the coming year of students. But uh, having been posted here from, 2000, from 1999 to 2003, in fact, he has many friends in Abu Dhabi, so it was very good of him to agree to spare some time to talk to, to us this evening. Um, Ambassador François Barat, as I said, is Consul General of Switzerland in New York. He was appointed to this post in 2010, having previously served as Ambassador of Switzerland to Lebanon from 2006 to 2010, as Swiss General Consul to Hong Kong and Macau between 2003 and 2006, and as Ambassador here in the UAE, as I have just mentioned, from 1999 to 2003, so before of the death of, 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 the, of the late and lamented uh, Sheikh Zayed. Uh, prior to this, he held several positions within the Swiss, Swiss Department of Foreign Affairs in Bern, uh, Tel Aviv, Washington, and Mexico City. Uh, Francois Barat received a PhD in legal anthropology from the University of London, uh, SOAS, which is the School of Oriental and African Studies in, in 1983 a master's degree in anthropology from the University of Virginia in 1976, and a law degree from the University of Geneva in 1974. I think it's right to say he considers himself, of course, a diplomat, but also an anthropologist. And it's a great pleasure to invite him to the podium tonight. I am very happy, as you may imagine, to, to be back in Abu Dhabi after now uh, 11 years. I left uh, Abu Dhabi 11 years ago. And before starting uh, my talk, I would like to say a few words about my relationship with NYU, which has something to do with Switzerland. Uh, NYU was founded by a Swiss in the early 19th century, a man called Albert Gallatin from Geneva. He was the second secretary of treasury of the treasury of, uh, in the US government and emigrated from, uh, from Switzerland at the end of the 18th century. And uh, we celebrated, I think, the 250th anniversary of his birth three years ago. And I sat at a dinner uh, next to John Sexton, the president of NYU. And uh, we started to talk. And for those who know, uh, John Sexton is quite an extraordinary person. So at the end of the, uh, of the dinner, he said, Francois, would you like to give a course at NYU? I said, okay, why not, you know, but uh, I never gave a course in my life. No, I think you have an interesting story to tell, and uh, I have the privilege to hire anyone to give a course in my university. So, so I said, let me think about it, and then I, uh, I accepted. And since then, I have, I'm giving a, a course on uh, uh, the topic I will talk about, uh, about tonight. With my students, basically, we explore the impact of the changes in the last 30 years, both in the world, but especially technological changes on the practice of diplomacy. What has changed for a diplomat in his daily tasks uh, since uh, the, 19, the 1980s? So a lot, you know, has happened since the 1980s, uh, but especially in technology, when you think about uh, internet, when you think about instant information and communication, when you think about social media, and all these changes have had a, I would say, profound impact on a profession which is one of the oldest in the world, which remains, in a way, uh, the same as remains the same for a thousand years as far as its, uh, as, as its goals, but the tools are today very different. So basically, I will share with you a bit the course, the content of the course I, I give to my students. And um, basically, I will uh, divide my talk in three parts. The first part, I will talk a bit about the changes. In the second part, I will uh, 
give you some practical examples about the impact of these changes on uh, the practice of diplomacy. And in the third part, I will explain to you what I think is or should uh, a 21st century diplomat be. What are the necessary qualities for a, for a diplomat in, in today's world? So let's start by the changes. When I started, uh, I entered the foreign ministry in 1986. Uh, it was still well, the end of the Cold War. Internet was, uh, I don't know if it had been invented, but was not really uh, uh, practiced and used. And uh, diplomacy was, I would say, uh, rather traditional. Uh, for example, uh, in our foreign ministry, quite a lot of diplomats came from, uh, of my colleagues came from old families. It was a very prestigious um, profession, and, uh, but which a profession which obeyed, I would say, to, in, at the end of the 21st century, to rules of the 19th century. And uh, then, in 30 years, things have changed a lot, and as I said, the basics remain the same, but it has become once in much, much more public, much, much more public. So what are the main changes in the last, uh, in the last uh, 30 years? The first change, you see really a relativization of uh, the concept of state sovereignty. Because we are, as diplomats, the representatives of the state. And today, uh, to represent the state has a very different meaning as you as 30 years ago. When I say relativization of state sovereignty, I can give you many examples. Just think about financial and technological flows and their impact on states. And a diplomat has absolutely no, uh, uh, no possibility or very little possibility to, to uh, have an impact on these technological and, and, and financial flows. Then um, you may think also about new concepts, which I would say relativize state sovereignty. I don't know if you heard about the concept of the right to protect. That means it's a concept which says that when a population is threatened, there is the right by the international community to uh, um, protect this population and to intervene. We have seen uh, that the right to protect used in Libya, we have not seen it in Syria, but nevertheless, you know, it's a concept which limits state sovereignty. Another uh, very important institution uh, which does the same in that regard is uh, the International Criminal Court. Uh, so uh, all this, you know, development tend to limit this, uh, the sovereignty of, uh, of the state. Then you have, I would say, a lot of new challenges which are global challenges and which can only be addressed globally by the community of nations. Think about uh, environment protection, think about migration, uh, think about uh, even the fight against poverty. All these challenges are global and a state alone cannot, uh, cannot do anything. And then you have many new actors which are non-state actors and will play a more and more important role in, uh, in international affairs and in diplomacy. All the NGOs, which uh, basically are there to, uh, to, have, to give a voice to people who have no voice. An institution, i just give you some example, an institution which is based in Switzerland, the World Economic Forum, which is not a state institution, and the World Economic Forum has become the place where the world leaders of the private sector and the public sector meet yearly in, uh, in Davos, Switzerland. Uh, think about individuals, you know, in, uh, I am presently serving in New York, and Bill Clinton is based in New York, which is uh, the Bill Clinton Initiative, which has a huge impact, or Bill Gates in the field of, uh, of, uh, of healthcare, or George Soros with the Open Society. Think about churches, think about universities, uh, or think tanks. There is, for example, one, uh, we, call, we can call it a think tank, very important think tank called the International Crisis Group, which not only makes analysis of conflicts around the world, but gives recommendations to governments. So all these non-state actors have also, in a way, I would say, a bit uh, 
yeah, relativized the importance of, uh, of, uh, of state sovereignty. Then, sorry. yes, another development which is quite interesting is the great increase in what we call symmetry um, diplomacy. That means more and more leaders travel, make visits, presidents, prime ministers, foreign ministers, and they talk to each other nearly every day on the phone. When the ambassador is informed, he can, he's lucky because most often, you know, they develop a personal relationship. And so this has very much changed uh, the work of the diplomat and of the ambassador because before the ambassador was the representative of the country in another country. Today, very often, um, prime ministers or ministers of foreign affairs talk directly. And uh, also this summitry, for example, with my students, we studied the trips of uh, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton around the world and how, how uh, that impacted on relationship with, uh, with various countries. And then you have a, uh, a huge development of conferences, either ad hoc conferences, international conferences, or conferences uh, within the WTO or the UN, which are ongoing conferences. And this also, as I would say, had, uh, had a great uh, impact on, uh, on, uh, on, our, um, on our profession. And then we come to the technological changes. That means you have as far as communication is concerned, we, you have now instant communication. There was, an, I think, an Egyptian ambassador who said, the worst enemy of the diplomat is CNN. Why it is CNN? Because <laughs> at three o'clock in the morning, the ambassador can be called by the ministry in, um, in Cairo to say, oh yes, we heard that there is this development. Please, what is your position? Tell us what, uh, what you think about it. So before, we, we wrote a report, we uh, you know, waited for the report to be read, and then there was a discussion, but everything was much uh, less, less rapid. Today, you are, you are very often asked to take a position of, on all kinds of issues. And uh, this instant communication, I would say, at the same time, uh, makes the life of the diplomat more difficult, but at the same time, uh, makes uh, his role more interesting because, for example, in shaping decisions, now, thanks to instant communication, we can really participate in the shaping of decision at the Ministry of, uh, of Foreign Affairs. Um, then another development is naturally, as I told you, the use of telephone, the use of all kinds of communication through internet, and there, there is a big, big problem with security, you know, security. So today, basically, uh, you don't know anymore what is really secure. And there is a, even a new form of diplomacy called the leak diplomacy. I think it always existed, but in the last weeks we had a few cases, I think, uh, a conversation between uh, Catherine Ashton, uh, the foreign minister of the EU, and the Estonian foreign minister about Ukraine. And uh, it was leaked, guess by whom? And then uh, another conversation between, I think, the Amer an American, Victoria Nuland, ab about Ukraine again, you know, so it was also leaked. So uh, uh, it's very, very touchy. But we had the big scandal two years ago of WikiLeaks, and uh, this has uh, um, caused a lot of problems for the Americans in, uh, quite a few, in quite a few countries, because one thing which has not changed at all and I think which will remain for forever, is diplomacy is based on trust. And uh, it's not so much the content of the cables, you know, which were <coughs> leaked by WikiLeaks, but the fact that, uh, uh, for example, uh, 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 an American ambassador was giving some assessment on uh, the behavior of a local minister, of, uh, of the government, etc. And so the trust was really broken by, by all these uh, this, uh, this events. And then another development is the development of what we call uh, social media. Social media have also changed our life because even if you don't like it, now uh, most government asks, uh, uh, asks their, their, uh, their diplomats to use blogs, Twitter, Facebook, and uh, basically an ambassador, the first thing he does in the morning, he should do 
at least in important posts, is to tweet. You know, so you tweet. Okay? So in my case, I have to say, <laughs> I, I am not very, uh, uh, I like Facebook very much. But tweet, I, I still, I'm still not at all, uh, I am not a tweeter. So, so I have asked one uh, academic intern in my, in, my, in my consulate, and I say, every morning you come and you say, please tell me, what do you want to tweet today? And then I have to think about it, and then I tweet. But uh, uh, I don't know whether it's a fad or it's really a something uh, uh, useful and important, but uh, uh, everyone from President Obama to uh, uh, Foreign Minister of, uh, of, of Iran, you know, everyone tweets these days. So <laughs> and then Facebook is also very, um, uh, uh, very useful. I will, I will speak about it a bit later. And uh, as I say, the blogs and so, so uh, basically, uh, as I already told you, the development in the last 30 years, diplomacy is becoming more and more public. And when you speak about public diplomacy, it's a kind of contradiction in term because diplomacy should be discreet, if not secret. And, and now we speak about public diplomacy and uh, it, it plays a more and more important role in our, um, in our life. So now let's come to the second part of my talk. I will try to show you, to, to tell you about some example how uh, uh, these changes, the changes I just mentioned, have impacted on our tasks. So for the sake of, of clarity, I have divided our tasks in seven, seven parts. So representing our country, this is the first task I, I would talk about, then reaching out, to uh, both to the authorities <coughs> and to um, the population of the country. <coughs> then the third, uh, the third uh, uh, it's reporting, which is very important, very important. The fourth is negotiating and mediating. And then the fifth task is cri managing crisis. The sixth task is servicing one's citizens in the country of residence. And the seventh task is managing the embassy. So these tasks um, are, I would say, the framework of our, of our daily work. And I will give you a few examples how this has been, uh, as these tasks have been impacted by the changes. Let's start by uh, representing. Representing, representation is really uh, what is the basis of our, of our job because we are the representative of our state we are, in a way, uh, a function. An American colleague who came to speak to my class said 80%, he was ambassador in Pakistan, he said 80% of my job as American ambassador is showing up. So, uh, you know, it's a bit, uh, I would say, <laughs> not sad, but, you know, just to represent. But it seems that uh, uh, that's what uh, that's we do. And what has changed a lot is the kind of representation. We, I will give you one very, very simple example, it's about uh, the embassy, the embassy as, as a location, you see. Uh, maybe some of you, I am sure, have already been to embassies, and normally they are beautiful buildings, and uh, we live in, in good conditions. And uh, uh, these buildings very often, I would say, reflect uh, the power, our statement, our statement for, 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 uh, for the importance of the state. But are they, very, are they really useful in today's world? I give you the example of, uh, of New York, you know. In New York, I live on, on the top floor, a very prestigious apartment building, etc. And our priority in New York is really to show Switzerland as an innovative and 21st century country. And we went to uh, our, our, I would say, target audience, our young people. And I have this beautiful residence, but every time I, I, I organize an event, I have to ask uh, uh, um, the doorman and the, the, the co-op, and it's very complicated. And on the contrary, we have in, uh, in Boston, we have another, uh, another kind of scientific embassy, which is a building very close to Harvard in Cambridge, 100 meters or maybe 200 meters from Harvard, totally open. To, uh, uh, to the street where students, professors, researchers come for all kinds of events, etc. So I, I would say that uh, uh, this 21st century diplomacy with its openness 
uh, uh, the Boston model corresponds much more to our needs than uh, the New York model. So this is you know, uh, one thing which has, uh, I would say, uh, changed, changed quite, uh, quite a lot. Then the second, um, the second task is uh, reaching out. So uh, we reach out both to the authorities and to the general public. Reaching out to the authorities has more or less remained the same. We, uh, we call it, you know, in, in diplomatic jargon, signaling. So you went to, uh, uh, you, you, you meet your counterpart at the Ministry of Affairs to speak about a specific problem, to signal uh, a, a certain, a certain uh, uh, topic which, which is of importance to, to, to us. So this, I would say, the relationship with the authorities has not, has not changed. There is one dimension which is akin to that. It's called transformal diplomacy. There are some countries who feel very important to uh, bring over to their country, the country of residence, their values and um, the way they, they, they see the world. And especially, you know, when it, is, it has to do with human rights or with, uh, with democratization. And, and some countries make a real effort to uh, uh, work with the local authorities to, to try to change, you know, a situation about democratization, about, about uh, human rights or economic development. And uh, this has become, I would say, more important. There are different ways to do it. Some people do it by engaging themselves with the country. Other, other countries are much more aggressive and do it a bit uh, unilaterally. But this has been, I would say, a phenomenon which has uh, taken more and more uh, importance in the, last, uh, in the last year. But what has really changed dramatically is reaching out to the general public. And we also, in diplomatic jargon, we call that soft, in a way, soft power. That means hard power is really uh, uh, working with the government and using the traditional diplomatic power uh, methods. Soft power is trying to develop a diplomacy of influence by reaching the citizens of, of, of the country and sharing with them uh, what your country, your own country is about, what your values are about, and uh, working on common project. And we call this also, I already used the term, public, public diplomacy. And, and this has, has uh, um, taken more and more importance. Just to give you an example, in, 19, in the 1950s, there was an ambassador, a British ambassador in France, he was in Paris for three years, and he gave two public, spe two, two public speeches in three years. That was in 1955, I think. I speak three to four times a week to all kinds of audiences. So now our, our motto is be present, be public. Uh, so we, we, uh, we, we do it with, uh, with different tools. The personality of the ambassador is not really very different. And what first, before, before saying something about the tools, maybe I should uh, speak a bit about uh, uh, the objective. The objective, as I say, is it's a bit public diplomacy is a bit different from advertising or from propaganda. It has something to do, but it has a much uh, longer term objective. The idea is really to build through all these public appearances and this joint project to build a kind of trust between the two countries. And also to uh, tell uh, um, the, your country of residence a narrative about your country, your own country, which is credible and which is, I would say, good for bilateral relationships. So it's a long, uh, uh, it's a long term process and you can use culture, you can use education, you can use science, you can use um, think tanks, you know, you, can, you, you have all kinds of, uh, of, uh, of uh, partners you can use to reach that, um, that goal. And the tools, well, the ambassador and uh, the team uh, of diplomats are, are naturally of, of essence. Uh, um, 
for we are, as I say, uh, asked to speak very often on all kinds of, of topics. Then we have uh, the embassy website, the embassy Facebook page. For example, in, uh, in, in New York, we have a Facebook page. We have one person which work, I think, 30% on a Facebook page with three, two to three posts a day. And uh, what we do every week, we have a, a meeting with uh, the various sections and we just make a kind of plan what kind of, uh, of, of posts we want to, to post on, uh, on our Facebook page. And I have to say, we have done that now for two years and it has had um, great results as far as I'm concerned. We have reached a lot of new people, of new friends, which we would have never reached, especially uh, young people. Because for most people, I would, uh, consul well, the consulate general is a bit different, I would say, from an embassy because what I do in New York is 95% public diplomacy. If I were in Washington or my colleague here in Abu Dhabi, uh, maybe the public diplomacy part of her, of her job is 30 or, you know, because, because they have all the traditional tasks of diplomacy. But in New York, 95% is public diplomacy. So uh, um, many, many people had the idea that the consulate general is just a place where you uh, renew a passport or you get a visa, but they had no idea about uh, this outreach functions of the consulate general. And thanks to the Facebook page, we have especially reached out to a lot of, of young people. We, uh, and we have decided that our target audience for New York are people between 25 and 40. And the idea is to have the voice of Switzerland heard and so that these people become our friends, become interested in our, in our science ventures, become interested in our economy, become interested in our culture. So the Facebook has been quite important. And we, uh, we employ, you know, the, I would say, in order for a Facebook page to, to, to be successful, it has to always remain actual. It has always, because if you have a dated Facebook page, it's worse than not to have a Facebook page. So, uh, uh, the advice I always give to my colleagues is have someone work maybe 20% or 30% on the Facebook page every day and have an actualized Facebook page because if it's outdated, it's, uh, it's, really, it's really bad. So uh, uh, we have uh, uh, someone who knows all these new, you know, Instagram, Tumblr, all these new tools and she after two years, we have been able, for example, to um, have a history of Swiss-New York relationship. We have uh, uh, really a complete history with maybe 20 or 30 posts. We have, uh, uh, it's very interesting about the Swiss, everything Swiss in New York. We are now a, a mine of, uh, uh, of information. And that's thanks to, to, uh, to, to Facebook. Twitter, as I told you, is something I am not so familiar with, but uh, it's more and more, um, and more and more used. Some people use blogs also. For example, I, I, I read regularly the blogs of the um, British ambassador to Lebanon. Very interesting. So he, he, sometimes it can, be, it can be a bit dangerous because, uh, 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 because you are, it's public. So I remember my colleague in Lebanon when I was there, there was a, a um, very well-known uh, Shia cleric who ju just passed away, and she admired that person. So on a, in her blog, she wrote, you know, I, uh, I went to the funeral of X, Y, and really, I admire him. Immediately, uh, some people read that blog, and that uh, person was linked to Hezbollah, and it was a big problem. Another example, my colleague, in, uh, a friend and colleague in Spain, uh, he was in charge of, at the Ministry of Foreign, of Foreign Affairs, of a um, uh, section or a division uh, which was responsible for the image of Spain. And he had a Twitter account. So he went to the World Swimming Championship in Barcelona. And a Spaniard won a medal. And at the award medal, uh, medal, medal, medal award ceremony, uh, I think some Catalans from Spain, you know, just started to shout against Spain. And he was so angry, he tweeted 
ah, these Catalans. So I know something bad about the Catalans. The, the next day, he lost his job. <laughs> so uh, those are about the, the, I would say, the dangers of, of Twitter. In matters of public diplomacy, I have to say that the United Arab Emirates are quite, uh, are quite good. I, I made some research about, uh, for example, what uh, uh, the Emirati Embassy in Washington does. Uh, they have outreach programs. What is all, also very important in public diplomacy, I forgot to tell you, is education. This, uh, you know, um, if you have a program of, of grants, of uh, scholarships, it's something which is long-term and which develops really a very good base of friends of your country. For example, when I come to a new country, one of our main jobs is to build, a, 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 I would say, a network of friends of Switzerland. And most often, the nucleus of this network of friends of Switzerland is made of former students, students who have, who have studied, who have done a degree in Switzerland. They remain loyal to, uh, to the country of the studies for the rest of their life, and they are very, very important. So uh, a very, very successful form of public diplomacy is um, go, go through education. And the UAE does it quite well. And also I visited uh, Shanghai, the World Exhibit, three or four years ago, and there was a UAE pavilion, which was very, very interesting. And which really they, they built a narrative, presented the narrative of the creation and the development of the UAE, which I, I have to say was very good and very positive for, uh, for, for the country. So every country now more and more understands the value of this soft diplomacy, this public, this public diplomacy. A few words about other tasks. Reporting. <coughs> Reporting, that means basically um, <clears throat> transmitting information about the ca your country of residence and analysis about the political events has always been one of the noblest tasks of, of the diplomat. It has changed a lot because now you don't, it's not that you don't have enough information, you have too much information. And before, you had a kind of, uh, I would say, monopoly of information in many countries because information was not so widespread. Today, you have to transform a, a huge amount of knowledge, of information, into wisdom. So it's not that uh, the role of the diplomat has diminished, but I would say it has, uh, it has really uh, changed. They ask you much, much more analysis. It's not, you know, you, you don't communicate an information anymore because an information, you can get it everywhere. The added value of the diplomat is really because you are on the spot and you are able to, to, to understand much better uh, um, the situation and to make, uh, and to make a, good, a, good, a good analysis. So another task which has not been so much impacted by uh, these changes is negotiating and mediating. This has been really, I would say, uh, one of the with reporting, given one of the noblest tasks of, of, uh, of, of diplomacy. And uh, uh, it is still very important. What has changed when you negotiate agreements is that agreements between countries have become more and more complicated and complex. And normally, negotiations are left to specialists, more and more. That means if there is a tax negotiation, a civil, uh, air rights negotiation. It's not the ambassador or the diplomats who really negotiate. They accompany the negotiating team, but uh, uh, people come from the capital to negotiate because <clears throat> these agreements have become so, so complex that we need, we need specialists. The added value of the diplomat, be, uh, besides being a good hotelier, uh, is, you know, by being in a, uh, on the spot, you have, uh, I would say, an overall view of the bilateral relationship between your country and the country of residence. So let's say someone comes, specialists from the tax authorities come to negotiate uh, um, a tax agreement. And there is a problem during the negotiation. The ambassador or, uh, and, and his team, they know the whole 
array of relationships. And they know that in another field, um, your counterpart would like to obtain something. So you can uh, uh, tell the negotiating team, OK, here you can, you can still ask for more because we know that the counterpart needs in another, in another domain uh, something from us. And so the added value of, of, of uh, the resident uh, diplomats is really to have this, I would say, overall view of, of bilateral relationships. So uh, reporting is, as I told you, still, uh, sorry, uh, negotiating remains very important. And uh, 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 I would say the principles of negotiations have not changed. Have not changed, you know, you can, you can read uh, about Talleyrand 200 years ago, and uh, they would basically uh, remain, the, remain the same, you know, and the qualities of a good negotiator remain the same, you know, to be able to uh, catch the right moment, the right opportunity, to be able to bring people together and uh, uh, to be able to... <coughs> to set up an agenda which is uh, good for, for negotiation. All these, you know, are, are skills which uh, I would say are as old as the world. What has changed a bit, you have more and more, I would say, second track negotiations. That means you have, it's not before it was mainly a state to state matter. Now you have a lot of other actors who may come into the negotiation, especially in, uh, in a, what we call second track. You can think about elder statesmen. You can think about a think tank, about um, some individuals or some groups, uh, church groups. And, and uh, you see more and more in important negotiations, especially political negotiations. I don't speak about you know, technical negotiation, but when negotiations become political, the involvement of, uh, of, uh, of, of other groups. So that's about negotiation and mediation. Then there are three last tasks I would like briefly to mention. The next task is crisis management. So managing crisis is something which is very important for a diplomat because in, many, in most countries, um, when you are a diplomat in, uh, I say in most countries, the press from your own country is not so interested by what you do. Or sometimes, you know, they can speak about uh, one event or another, but generally speaking, it's not a topic. When there is a crisis, immediately all the media are in become interested in what you do. Let's say there is a kidnapping, there is a war, there is a um, difficult situation, and there you are really in the spot, in the spotlight of, uh, of, of the media. And uh, uh, um, it has become more and more important for the diplomats to be really well trained in crisis management. So I give you an example. I was ambassador in Lebanon. I arrived in February 2006. In June 2006 uh, or July 2006, there was a war between Israel and Hezbollah. And for 40 days, uh, you had bombings and all kinds of things throughout Lebanon. We have around 5,500 uh, Swiss living in Lebanon. And suddenly I had to find a solution to bring them to Beirut, to put them on a ship, to send them to Cyprus, to, um, and then to Switzerland by plane. So it was, you know, a, a crisis. And suddenly no, no no journalist, no Swiss journalist had ever talked to me before, and suddenly I had 10 co phone calls a day. What are you doing with the Swiss? Do you treat them well? My minister immediately called me, take good care of this Swiss. So it's the same thing with, uh, with people who are kidnapped or people who are so, uh, uh, it's extremely important. And it has, I would say, uh, uh, um, increased in importance in the, in the, in the last years. And in the same, in the same uh, field, servicing your citizens. Because many, many people question in your own country, 
the utility of embassies. They say, what, what are these embassies, these ambassadors? They go from parties to party. What, are they, you know, what is their use in today's world? You know, they spend tax money. And, and, and accountability has become very, very important. With this, it's part of this, I would say, uh, uh, this trends towards transparency. So uh, um, we have to really give a very good service to our community. And uh, I think we put more and more emphasis on, on this dimension of, of servicing the community. And then uh, the last uh, task, which is also ours, is to manage our embassy. And there you have a tremendous change. Before, the embassy was just totally linked to uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And today, in most, for in most ministries, embassies operate as, I would say, uh, small enterprises. We receive uh, uh, every year our budget, and we have to manage uh, our budget. But they are naturally controls. But we have become very independent, and um, they ask us for a kind of return on investment. They say, OK, we invest so much in country X, in country Y. What is the return on the investment? So I would say uh, um, now you see more and more an entrepreneurial culture in the management of, uh, of embassies. And this is for a civil servant, I think the word uh, upside down, because that was not at all what you, we used to, uh, how we used to, to, to work and how we used to. Uh, so, but uh, it happens in, in, uh, in, uh, in more and more uh, countries. So. Um, those are, I would say, some of uh, the impact of the changes on, on our tasks. To summarize, diplomacy, which was, I would, if not secret, discreet, has become more and more public. This is, this is and more and more accountable. So accountability and, uh, and, and publicity are, I would say, the two huge changes in the last, uh, in the last 30 years. So what would be the qualities of a 21st century ambassador or 21st century diplomat? The two, I would say, uh, um, new, new important qualities he has to acquire, he did not necessarily have to have uh, uh, before, are the first quality is communication skills. So the communication skills are, are so important that uh, you need to, to be trained in working with the media, you need to be trained in uh, speaking public, you need to be trained in engaging with people. And uh, I would really uh, not advise someone who is overly timid you know, and shy uh, to become a diplomat, because well, you, you lose your shyness with time. You know, it's something. But but uh, this is something which uh, is really very uh, very important. And the other skill which is indispensable is management skills. Before, as I told you, we were very dependent of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. We received instruction, and we just had to follow instruction. Now nowadays, we have to manage an embassy, a consulate general, like a, a small company. And uh, at the end of the year, we have to show that we have uh, spent the money allocated properly, that uh, uh, we know how to, to uh, take care about human resources, about uh, buildings. So it's a, for most of us, it's a, new, um, it's a very, very new way to, to, to look at our, at our profession. Otherwise, I would say that the basic qualities remain the same. The first quality for me of a diplomat is curiosity. If you are not curious of the world, because you are paid, I, I like to say, a diplomat is paid to be curious. You, because you are paid to, 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 to meet people, naturally always thinking about, about defending and, propo and promoting the interests of your country. You are, you are paid to understand situation, you are paid to, to, uh, to report on, on, on a particular situation. So if you lack this curiosity of people and this curiosity of other culture and of the world, it's better to do, to do something else. Then the second 
quality is flexibility. Because every four years, we change country. Several times a year, we change collaborators, colleagues. So if you are rigid, do something else. But don't, don't become a diplomat, because you will be very, very, uh, very unhappy. And then another quality which is very important is empathy. Because I, I don't say that you have to fall in love with your country of residence. But it, it helps a lot if you, if you have some empathy with um, the people you know, uh, both the authorities and, and, and the population of the country of residence, because you are also paid to engage, to engage with, uh, with them. And if you don't have this, uh, this empathy, you know, it's a bit more, more difficult. And then I would say a last quality, which is a bit, if there is an English word, serendipity. I don't know if you know what serendipity means. It's a word which means, uh, to, to, to take advantage of opportunities. It's, I think it's a bad translation, but something like that. You, know, you have to engage, to have many contacts, to, 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 um, you know, uh, to be curious, but always trying to catch the opportunity to advance your agenda. But not do it uh, uh, with purpose, but inadvertently it comes, you know, and a new project, uh, is born and a new uh, opportunity uh, arises, and and this serendipity. I think I, I like very much this uh, this term. I would say that as a conclusion, the goals of the profession have not changed at all. That means defend and promote the interests of your country. As simple as that. But the tools have become uh, much more complex, it has become, uh, yeah, um, as, as I say, a much more, a much more transparent uh, profession. And uh, as I, I gave you some example where this transparency can be, can be dangerous, can be dangerous. It has become, uh, uh, also the world is becoming more complex because you have to engage with a lot of non-state actors before you had a, a kind of the monopole of you know, your state representation. Today, we work on a daily basis with uh, NGOs, with churches, uh, uh, with think tanks, and uh, we try to incorporate, for example, what is fascinating in uh, peace, because one of the tradition of Switzerland is peacemaking. And uh, when you try to bring peace to a particular country, before, you were working with another state. Today, you can use, you know, you will, you will make more progress by using, for example, unions and, and to have uh, uh, leaders of some labor unions who have a specific relationship among each other and then you create trust or churches or uh, universities or prof you know. So you, you have to learn to really get out of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and to take advantage of all the possibilities which are, which are, uh, which are open to you, which are open to you. So um, that's more or less what I, I, some of the things I explored with my students. Now uh, I open the floor to, uh, to, to questions. And uh, I hope you found it interesting. Thank you. <laughs>
So my yeah. question is like, if if actually something like embassies and, and ambassadors, will it really exist in, in the future? And maybe not now, like 10 years from now, but let's say 100 years from now. Yeah. Like when we have like truly global earth. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. To answer your first question, if I remember well, you know, ambassadors were for a long time non-resident. They just, you know, they were they sent ambassadors for a particular purpose with gifts, especially, you know, gifts giving uh, among leaders, among kings, etc. And an ambassador was giving, uh, uh, handing over the gifts and then negotiating some, some agreements. And the resident embassy started in, uh, I think, the 16th century in Italy first. And then it became formalized in f by the French uh, in the 17th, 18th century. And uh, by the 19th century, most countries, you know, had, uh, at least large countries, had resident ambassadors. But as I said, it was a very closed world. Most ambassadors, or nearly all ambassadors, were aristocrats. It's, uh, they were uh, uh, basically uh, managing the world, you know, among themselves. And uh, uh, so this has changed a lot in the 20th century. Your second question. I forgot to say that when I say that the state sovereignty is being relativized, one of the big, big changes has been the rise of supranational uh, institutions and also the rise within the country of regions. So I give you two examples, the EU. Now uh, you have, uh, I mentioned briefly uh, Catherine Ashton, she's a foreign minister of the EU. and. Uh, uh, it seems that now the EU is in, I, I, we are not part, you know, Switzerland is not part of the EU. So I, I, I don't know exactly the development, but they are developing their own uh, uh, diplomatic, uh, diplomatic core. And slowly, I would say that there is a good possibility that uh, this diplomatic core will replace, in a way, national uh, uh, diplomats, you know. There will be European diplomats. And, uh, but what you also see, I give you a few examples, Quebec, uh, Belgium, and, and Catalonia. Those are, country, those are regions of a country where basically uh, we, have, we have developed their own uh, diplomatic network. And for example, in, uh, in New York, there is a um, Flander, House of Flanders. And even if you go to, to uh, the Belgian embassies in matters of trade and culture, you have the French part as its representative and the Flemish part as its representatives. Catalonia also has the same. And Quebec, they have a Quebec house. So, so you have at the same time supranational institutions, which are being uh, um, you mentioned also the GCC. And then you have regional and uh, the, uh, the idea being, you know, to, 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 to promote their, um, their, their interests. Yeah. Thank you very much for a very interesting lecture. Uh, I have some quick questions. And one is, uh, how much latitude does a diplomat have in taking initiative, et cetera, given that there are, there's a lot of state-to-state -state diplomacy? Yeah. Uh, then uh, the other thing is that uh, how frequent are the opportunities to communicate with the leaders of the host country? Like, is it from meeting to meeting, or can one ambassador just call? So uh, the first uh, the first question, I, I would say my experience. If you, it depends really a lot. Um, a lot it differs a lot from embassy to embassy, from country to country. Uh, basically, what we do in, in the case of Switzerland in October, months of October, November, we put a list of priorities for the next year. So we write down these priorities and then we send them to our ministry. They, dis they, they circulate them, they discuss them, and then we come to a compromise, you know, to a, so we, they add something or they take off something. And then we have this uh, agreement between the foreign ministry and the ambassador about the priorities for, for the next year. Once you have done that, you are pretty uh, free to take initiatives. If you are, for example, I would say, my colleague in Brussels, Brussels European Union, is much less free than I am because 
there are so many delegations, so many people interested in what goes on in Brussels that his agenda basically is set by the visits, by uh, uh, current problems. So he is, he is not as free as um, I would say uh, my colleague here or, or uh, in, most, uh, in, most, uh, in most countries. That's Switzerland. Other countries, maybe there is more control. And then at the end of the year, you know, the next October, we just assess whether we have reached the priorities, we have, uh, we have reached our, our, our goals, and uh, that's how, um, how, it, uh, how it works. And the second question was? Opportunities for communication with the leaders of the host country. Yeah, so although it depends, you know, some countries are quite easy, other countries are um, very, very, very difficult. One of the main, maybe, a quality I forgot to, to mention is access, because a, a good diplomat must have access. And for example, uh, I give you the example of, of Switzerland in Washington, or most countries in, you know, in Washington an ambassador is uh, um, assessed by the possibility of having a visit of his president or prime minister to President Obama. This is, you know, if an ambassador has succeeded to have his president or prime minister visit President Obama, then he has had a successful mission, which is not an easy thing because in Washington you have 190 embassies, and I would say maybe 25 to 30 which count. That means close allies, enemies, neighbors, you know. So if you are, you know, uh, <laughs> Afga the Afghan president, you will immediately have a, a meeting with President Obama. If you are the Swiss president, it's a bit more complicated. Also, <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe it speaks well for Switzerland, I don't know, <laughs> but <laughs> it's, uh, it's uh, because, you know, uh, uh, the Americans, they say, well, we love Switzerland. But we don't have any problem with Switzerland, you know. So, so, so why, why should President Obama see your president? We are a great country. So, so uh, access is extremely, extremely, is, is, of essence, is of essence. So in some countries, it's, uh, uh, I would say, quite easy. In Washington, it's uh, quite, uh, uh, quite complicated. Yeah, yeah. Okay, how, uh, how do you view the, from a diplomatic point of view, the events in Ukraine and Crimea? And how do you see things developing? You know, so, so uh, we, we play, uh, uh, Switzerland plays uh, an important role because our uh, uh, Switzerland has the presidency this year of this organization, OSCE, it's called Organization of Security and Cooperation in Europe which is an organization we play, which played an important role, especially in the 80s, in, in Yugoslavia, and in, in, in the Caucasus. And, uh, but basically, it is the main forum to discuss security issues in, uh, uh, and in Europe, and it incorporates all the countries. So our president, uh, Monsieur Burkhalter, who is also our foreign minister, um, is now discussing with uh, the various parties to find, and he has named a representative to, uh, uh, for Crimea, and they are trying to get some observers. I, I would say, you know, uh, 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 we, you know, the official position of Switzerland is that, is that uh, 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 for example, t today I think there is this referendum, it's against international law, you know, because a referendum as such is not against international law, but it, it must follow certain procedure, and naturally Ukraine is not. So it's, uh, that said, personally, you know, it's a very, very complicated uh, uh, issue, because if you look at the history, I, I like history because it tells you a lot of things, you know, uh, uh, the cradle of Russia is Kiev, you know, in Ukraine. So it's not just two countries, you know, it's a much more complicated thing. Half of the population of Ukraine, they speak Russian, or the East Crimea has a Russian majority. So I, I would say uh, 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 legally, 
you know, uh, uh, Ukraine is an independent state and, and uh, its independence should be guaranteed. And then there is uh, the, the weight of history, of the population, of, uh, and uh, um, we were talking with, uh, yeah, you are here from, f yeah, uh, gentlemen from Finland, because a few days ago, uh, in, I think in the New York Times, there was an op-ed by Brzezinski, which, who used to be a Secretary of State uh, many years ago, and he was uh, uh, proposing the Finlandization of Ukraine. So, and uh, my friends there, as Finn said, you know, we don't like the word Finlandization. Because <laughs> we hate it. So Finlandization is basically, you know, Finland during the Cold War, they were neighbors of, of, of Russia. So uh, an arrangement was found for Finland to be part of the West, but to have a special arrangement with Russia not to threaten Russia's security. Is, is it, that is more or less, that's the answer. So, so uh, 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 for example, in Lebanon, very often I heard, yes, there should be a Finlandization of Lebanon because Lebanon and Syria, you know, to have a Lebanon against, I, I, I am speaking not of the current situation, but of the situation before the war, a Lebanon against Syria is not in the interest of Lebanon because the two countries are so, are so, and, and like a, a Ukraine against Russia, I don't know if, it is in, if it's in, 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 in the interest of, uh, of, uh, of uh, Ukraine. That said, you know, it's a, a, a history, history in the making, and uh, between, I have never been to Ukraine, but it seems that between Lviv, which is to, uh, near, near Poland, and, and this is very oriented to the west, and maybe Donetsk, I don't know, Kharkiv, why not? They are, it's, it's the same country, but completely different world. So. Um, I'm not a diplomat, but I am curious yeah. <laughs> about one, <laughs> one topic. Uh, was the um, uh, Swiss embassy uh, in, uh, in the US uh, involved in the negotiations and the mediations between uh, uh, Switzerland and the US with regards to the tax uh, evasion uh, for the uh, Swiss banks? Yeah. Okay, uh, that's I, uh, can you give us a little bit yes, of yes. color and flavor on I that? Will, I, will, uh, I will tell you a bit. You know, first of all, you know, this question is, a, is an important question, but in my four years in New York, maybe maximum five times people have talked to me about it. So it's a, it's a huge problem in Switzerland and uh, in, in New York at least, you know, there is a big problem, we say, it, be, we say in New York, we say between Main Street and Wall Street. For you who are in the financial world, you may understand. That means every week there is a scandal. That means one week it's HSBC, the next week it's Goldman Sachs, the third week it's UBS, the fourth week. So people after 2008 have lost confidence in the financial system. So the Swiss problem is embedded in that more general problem. That said, uh, uh, we, uh, I, have, I have not been, it's our embassy in Washington which has been uh, involved in the negotiations. And for the Americans, it's a technical issue. That means, they say, you know, uh, some Americans have broken the law with the help of Swiss banks. So we just, you know, we love Switzerland, but uh, uh, we cannot accept that. So Switzerland has to give us the name of, um, of, of the tax evaders and to, uh, the, the banks have to pay a fine. And uh, it is in the hands of the IRS and, and the Department of Justice. And we have tried, but apparently without much success, to raise it to a political level. That's normally what you do. When you have a problem like that, you say, but, you know, okay, we understand your point of view, but let's try, you know, to, 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 to find the, the culprits, but in a way that we have to understand that uh, uh, we are one of the main investors. Switzerland is always... In 2010, we were the first foreign investor in America because Novartis, one of our companies, had bought a huge. So we have uh, uh, we share the same values. We have we represent your interest in Iran. We we have so many, you know, we have so many sh things in common. It's not fair to to treat us like that 
especially when you do the same thing for citizens of South America in Miami, for example, you know, just to... Uh, so we, we tried really to, to raise the whole issue to a political level. But uh, the Americans, you know, Ameri well, they have also the, you, you know that, uh, you know, they, they now introduce FATCA for the whole world, you know, basically. So uh, they are kind of uni unilateralists when it comes to, to, <laughs> uh, to many things. And, and uh, basically what we have done, finally, we, no, normally some people say, but why does the government is involved in a problem between the banks and, um, and clients, you know, the government should not be involved. The government should uh, just let the bank take care of themselves, you know. And uh, we nevertheless decided because there is a problem of application of Swiss law and US law, which are not the same. So we decided to help or to support our banks. And we would jointly, we devised a kind of program with the Americans. That means that the banks can choose uh, there are four categories, and they can choose one category. Either they have really, uh, I think there are 12 banks who are in category one, then banks who have reasonably, uh, they have reasonable doubts that they have American clients, then banks who have very few American clients, and then banks who have no clients. It's a program which I would say uh, is not really an international agreement. It's just a program of the Department of Justice and most of the banks, because in that uh, question, the Americans have one huge, huge uh, weapon. That means that they control the dollar, the dollar market. And if a bank is indicted, it is cut off from all these mechanisms. So that means an in, a bank with, which is indicted just goes into bankruptcy. So they have a position of strength, and, and, uh, and they use it. And I have to say that as far as uh, we are concerned, you know, I always say people don't to talk to me about it, but now we start to see some consequences on our bilateral relationships. I give you two examples. Swiss banks, they don't want to have anything to do anymore with the US. So it's extremely complicated, impossible for a US resident to open a, a, a bank account in Switzerland. And that means that Swiss residents in America, people with a Swiss passport, cannot uh, open a bank account in Switzerland. And so someone, for example, who uh, I met a lady who received uh, her old age pension, and she just used to put it in an account. Suddenly, she received a letter from a bank. You have 15 days to close your account. So, uh, and and my, my argument is to say, you cannot say that having a bank account is a human right, but you can say that without a bank account, someone cannot function normally in, in his own country, and that's not normal. And I am trying to fight to find a way for the Swiss, because every time I visit Swiss communities, I have people complaining, what, what, what is this, you know? We have been law-abiding citizens, we have not hidden our taxes, and we cannot have a bank account in Switzerland. And the other thing is that we have a lot of American companies who are established in Switzerland. And uh, uh, now they start to say, but our, um, um, our staff, you know, American staff, they come to Switzerland, will they be able to open a bank account? Will we be able, as an American company, to, to, to do banking operations? So, so it's really, uh, we, we, we hope to, to find a solution very quickly. But it's a, it's a tough problem. Thank you. One of the major objectives of diplomacy is to discover the intentions of other countries. Yeah. Um, in your opinion, are the internet and social media sufficiently influential now that they can actually change the intentions of some countries? And which types of countries are most susceptible to that? Yeah. No, I don't, <coughs> I, I, I don't think really that they can change, they can contribute to to, to, you know, to change the opinion. But as such, I, I don't have, maybe we overvalue, you know, uh, 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 the impact of, uh, of social media. We, well, social media, had, it's a bit different from your question, but had a lot of impact during the Arab Spring, as you may remember, 
but it was short, uh, sh short lived, you know, short lived. So uh, I, I would say that the use of social media is just one of the tools to change or to, to change uh, um, the view about your country or to, uh, or, or to uh, uh, project the intentions of a country, but by far not the, not the, the, um, the traditional ways, you know. Uh, uh, traditional diplomacy is still very, very important. And then um, so social media is an additional tool, but, uh, but uh, for me, not, not more, but necessary because every, every embassy now uh, that I know in the U.S. starts uh, uh, to, to use, and the Americans are the best, you know. But for me, you know, as, as far as, as the Americans, just as a, an anecdote, uh, they are very, very open and transparent, you know, in, in the use of the social media. So you can chat with the Secretary of State, you can, they really project an image of a very open country. And then, in the world, every American embassy is a fortress impenetrable. So there is a, a, a small contradiction between, you know, chatting with uh, Secretary of State Kerry or, or Clinton, you know, and trying to get <laughs> an access to for a visa in an American embassy. So there is a reality check, you know, very quick reality check. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious about the role of languages and speaking other languages. English has dominated uh, on a global scale now, it's kind of like the new lingua franca. Do you find the roles of other languages helpful? Do you speak any other languages? And how yeah. do they function in your role? I, I would say that uh, I told you that one of the qualities of a good diplomat is to engage. And it's not so much to master uh, another language, but if you speak some words, if you show, you know, it's empathy, you, you have to show empathy with the, with the country of residence. So learning basic sentences, if possible, going a bit further. And, and we, we get, you know, we get funds when we come to a new country to learn the language. I think it's a great help because the people of the country you serve in feel, feel does this diplomat like the country or he does not like the country? And it makes a, it makes a, it makes a huge difference. So. Uh, Traditionally, the language of diplomacy was French. Now it's something of, of the past. Now it's, uh, it's English all over. Uh, there are still, I think, five official languages at the UN, uh, English, French, Spanish, Arabic, and Chinese, if I am not Russian. I, uh, but uh, and all the documents are translated. And then um, today, everyone communicates in English, but if you can show that you, you speak a few words of the language of your country of residence, uh, it's, it's all about, you know, empathy, building a network of friends, building trust. Yes. Very Thank good. you very much. Thank you so much. Have a good